All right, guys, so today's been kind of a, a rough day for me. I injured my foot uh, a couple of days ago doing exercise. And yeah, exercise, guys, it can be dangerous. Uh, <laughs> when you exercise, do so at your own risk and uh, don't put too much pressure on yourself because it can actually do more harm than good. If uh, you don't know what you're doing or if uh, you have problems with some part of your body already, anyway. I am trying to uh, finish this book here. It's called Death in Florence. Interesting book. It's kind of like a pop history book. I think I, the the author's name is Paul Strather. And, um, I, I don't really think this guy is actually an official historian, but he I think he wrote some novels. Um, yeah, prize-winning novelist. But nonetheless, he definitely has done research on uh, this subject. Uh, it is about the Medici family, the fall of the Medici family in light of Florence's um, story with uh, Girolamo Savonarola, who was a very famous preacher in the 15th century in Renaissance uh, Europe, specifically in Italy. And uh, Girolamo Savonarola was a guy who was trying to purge Italy of its vices, of its evils. Um, he did not like, for example, the emphasis on paganism that the Renaissance definitely had. Uh, he did not like the prevalence of, of Sodom in, in Florence. And by Sodom, I mean homosexuality. It was very, very uh, prevalent. It was very common. And this really flies into the face of of the misconception that some people can have when they think, oh, you know, back in the day it was Christian and blah, blah, blah. Today, you know, it's just full of feminism and rainbow flags. And it's like, well, yeah, but this evil is very, very old and um, it's been here since the fall of man. So, Savonarola was trying to battle all these things, but of course he was met with very vicious resistance. There were a number of factions, political factions that were against him. Uh, there was the Arabiati, the enraged ones, that's what that means, the Arabiati, and these were people who hated the idea of a religious influencer having a say-so in society and in government. And then there was also the BG, the BG, 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 the BG were basically like the Arabiati, but maybe a little bit less uh, forthcoming, a little bit less obvious um, about, their, about their agenda, right? They were a little bit more tempered. But still, there were har hardliners within the BG faction. Um, now, I'm almost done with this book. I got maybe like... 80 pages left to go, maybe a little bit more. But anyway, um, try to finish it. Hopefully, I'll finish it by tomorrow or the day after that. Uh, I'm trying to finish this book. Um, I want to do more reading. Um, I want to read more books. Uh, so, Medici... Uh, there was there was the great banking family, right? There, there was this huge, very powerful banking family. It was called the Medici family. It goes back to a guy named Cosimo de Medici. And Cosimo de' Medici founded the Medici Bank, which was the most powerful bank at one point in European history. And uh, Cosimo de' Medici had a son by the name of Piero de' Medici, who also took the reins of the bank from his father. And then before he died, he had a son named Lorenzo de' Medici, who um, inherited his father's wealth and power. And of course, the bank. Uh, Lorenzo de' Medici uh, was very popular. Uh, he gave a lot of money away. He would throw these huge extravagant uh, parties and he would uh, orchestrate these big, big festivals every single year in Florence. He would give away things for the poor. Like a lot of people loved Lorenzo de' Medici. Now, again, a lot of people also hated him because there was a high taxation that was imposed on people in Florence. And uh, even people who were working class, regular folks, normal folks, whatever, just, just just the working folk, they were being imposed with this heavy taxation. Of course, you needed a lot of taxes in order to fund all the things that Florence was doing. Uh, but it sucked to have to you know to have to 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 be forced to pay all this money. So there were a lot of people who hated Lorenzo de Medici. Um, 
And and the, the Medici family was very powerful, as I've said already. For example, a pope would approach Lorenzo de Medici. He wanted Medici to give him a whole bunch of money so that he could buy the lordship of an area called Imola for his nephew. And uh, Lorenzo de Medici thought, wait, where is this? Where? You want to give your, your nephew power over a place called Imola? Where is that? Oh, that's where my trade routes are. No, you're messing with my business. And he would tell the Pope, uh, uh, ciao tutto, arrivederci, whatever they say in Italian for go screw yourself. I don't, I'm not interested. And um, the Pope hated this. And the Pope even tried to get Lorenzo de' Medici killed. Uh, there was uh, an assassination attempt on him. And his brother ended up getting stabbed to death by two priests. Yes, this actually happened. Crazy story. Lynch mob came, took one of the priests, cut his you-know-what off, and um, and lynched them. Uh, they got another priest, and they wrapped a rope around his neck and threw him off a window and broke his neck, kind of like that scene in the movie Scarface where the guy gets flung out the helicopter with a rope around his neck. It was straight-up mafia. I mean, this was Italian mafia circa... 1400s, uh, and the church was involved. Very, very crazy. Very crazy. You know, we we might think like, oh, you know, uh, everybody was all pious, and the Pope was pious, and they were just there to praise God and pray and say the rosary all day and read the Bible and read and do homilies all day, but, they, but behind the curtains, there was some mafia stuff going on. So Lorenzo de' Medici, he had two sons. He had uh, uh, Giovanni de' Medici and he had Piero de' Medici. He had a lot of hope for Giovanni. He saw Giovanni as intelligent, as cunning, as uh, more intuitive, more uh, responsible than his other son, Piero de' Medici. So he wanted Giovanni to become a cardinal. And the reason for this was because Lorenzo de' Medici had these grand dreams for his family. He wanted the Medici fam family to become so powerful that they would eventually rule the Vatican. His dream was that there would there would eventually be a Medici pope. Well, how how do you make someone a pope? You first have to make them a cardinal. So he offered a whole bunch of money, tens of thousands of florins to the pope at the time, uh, basically bribing the pope to give his son, Giovanni de' Medici, uh, uh, a, a position as a cardinal. And the pope was very hesitant, but Eventually, the Vatican took the money because it needed the money. So it took the money. Eventually, Giovanni de' Medici was allowed to become a cardinal. He had to go through uh, seminary. He had to go through uh, theological education. But eventually, the man became a cardinal. And it was a part of this whole envisioning that Lorenzo de' Medici had for, uh, for there to be a Medici pope. The other son, on the other hand, Piero de' Medici, was given the, the authority over the city and over the bank and uh, it's very interesting before he died Lorenzo de' Medici gave his sons a set of simple instructions or simple habits to observe simple habits to continue on and one of those habits was to get up early it was to it was to eat light don't eat extravagantly too much don't eat rich foods every single day like we do today you know we eat mcdonald's every single day um don't eat that every single day uh and get up early so live simple this was basically what lorenzo de medici was trying to convey to his sons and Giovanni de' Medici, he became a cardinal, and he would follow those habits for the most part. He got up early, he woke up, he, uh, he got up from bed, he, he read until the afternoon. This was a habit that he would follow. He'd get up early, pick up a book or, or whatever, and read until the afternoon, which is a pretty good habit to follow if you have the time, because you can learn a lot. And... Uh, uh, Piero de' Medici, the other son, who would have this power over the bank, uh, or over the Medici bank, he would start to follow this. Uh, there's a letter that was sent from Lorenzo de' Medici to his son Piero, and he said, "Son, for the for the love of everything that is good, get up early. Get up early. Seriously, get up early. Don't get up late." 
And I think the reason why he told his son this was because his son was probably waking up late. I mean, think about it. He was wealthy. He came from this, well, he came from a very wealthy family, didn't have much to worry about as far as finances and food went. He enjoyed hunting. He enjoyed fencing. He enjoyed dancing. He enjoyed women. He was living an extravagant lifestyle. He was living that TikTok multimillionaire lifestyle. And he was, I guess you could say, he was kind of like the equivalent of what the Zoomer generation is. You know, they're young and uh, they just want to live that life. Anyway, everybody wants to live that life. Make no mistake. Well, most people do. But anyway, uh, Piero de Medici, he took the, he took, he inherited his father's power and, uh, it, it really wasn't working that well for him. Um, his his power began to collapse very quickly, and there was a revolution. There was a revolution, and a bunch of people rose up, and they threw the Medici family out of Florence. And Piero de' Medici fled. His brother Giovanni picked up as much of the artwork that the Medici family owned as he could and got it out of the city and this would prove very helpful because it helped uh the family uh get a lot of money and Piero de Medici he went to Rome and he began to conspire to get the city back well who took power uh there were there were there were a number of things that happened. Uh, Savonarola began to help to to determine the style of government that would uh, that would be over Florence. He wanted more of a republican form of government. He wanted to give more power to the people as far as as far as democracy went, uh, because the Medici family had so much power over the government in Florence. Um, so, for example. There was a council that ruled over the city. It was called the Signoria. Signoria was about an eight-man council that was elected by another council that consisted of about 100 people. And what they would do is they would get all the names of the candidates for the Signoria, write them down in little pieces of paper, and then they would sort of randomly pick the, the pieces of paper from, I don't know, a vase or a jar or whatever, and that's how they did their election. Well, the Medici would make sure that the pieces of paper that would be picked were the were, were had the names of those that they wanted to be in the Signoria, people who were pro-Medici. And Savonarola knew this, and he wanted to get rid of this, so he tried to reform Florence. So this, there was the Signoria, and then there was the religious influence coming from Savonarola. And this went on for years. Savonarola tried to purge his city of homosexuality and pedophilia, which was extremely prevalent in those days. It's And this is doesn't just come from the testimony of, uh, of of Savonarola. This also comes from the testimony of Bernardino of Siena. Bernardino of Siena was another preacher uh, in Italy. He preached in Florence, but he also preached in his hometown of Siena, hence the name. And he talked about how Florence was so full of pedophiles that you couldn't even send your son out of the house. If you had a young a uh, son, uh, a small uh, male child, you couldn't even send them out of the house without him getting sexually accosted by a pedophile. This is this is what he says. This is how bad Florence was and Siena was as well. So this was a huge problem. And Savonarola was trying to fight this. And both Bernardino of Siena and Savonarola received violent resistance for this. For example, Bernardino of Siena was uh, attacked by a... Uh, uh, a pro uh, a pedophile person with a knife. Uh, there were a couple of cases where uh, people tried to murder Savonarola because of his views and because of his uh, his efforts. There was a, a very strong faction called the Arabiati, which was very anti-religion. So much so that at one point Savonarola did a uh, a procession, a religious procession, in which some young men who were very ardent followers of Savonarola, who were very idealistic, they wanted to clean the city up. They did this procession, and one of them was holding up this giant cross, and a group of Arabiati people who were pro. Sodom. They went to the procession. They grabbed the cross, and one of them split the cross in two. And this was in the 1400s, which really goes to show that there is nothing new under the sun. So um, eventually, Piero de Medici returns back 
to Florence. He returns back with an army. He's on a horse, and he is about to take his city. And there were a number of people, a good number of people in Florence who were very, very pro-Medici, and they wanted to see the return of the Medici reign. And so some of these pro-Medici people, they left Florence, they went out to they they went out of the city, they met with Piero de Medici and they said, "Listen, Piero, we are going to bring you back into the city. People are going to love you. Um, more than likely there's going to be violence in the city, but then that's when we're going to open up the gates for you and you're going to enter triumphantly." And so the day came for this to happen and nothing happened. Piero de' Medici was waiting there with his army. Nothing happens. Nobody opened up the gates for him. There was no triumphant welcoming for him. There was no there, there was no crowd of people throwing grains of rice at him. Nothing happened. Nothing. There was nothing but dead silence. The sound of silence. Why? Well, before Piero de' Medici arrived outside of the city, there was a famine in the city of Florence. There was a horrible famine. What caused this famine was excessive rainfall. And you would think, excessive rainfall, you should be having like tons of crops with excessive rainfall. With excessive rainfall comes root rot, and which leads to the death of crops. So too much rain is actually very dangerous, just like too much sun is very dangerous for crops. You need a balance between the two. This is why Hawaii is such a green place, because it rains every hour there for like five minutes. Um, and, so, and so all these crops were destroyed. Tons of wheat was destroyed. And typically, the price of wheat was about less than one lira. The price went up to about over three lira, and then eventually it went up to over five lira, which was unthinkable. People were starving to death on the streets. The church had to come and give away free wheat to people, but people were still starving to death. Uh, and then eventually there was a bunch of food that came as aid into Florence. I think it came from a city called Livorno. Uh, and that is what saved the people from starvation, was that aid. So what the pro-Medici crowd was kind of hoping for was that there would be enough turbulence in uh, in Florence, that people would want Piero de' Medici to come to save them, but because they were already saved from starvation, people didn't really see any need to embrace Piero de' Medici. So all that welcomed poor Piero de' Medici was the sound of silence. That's all there was, and Piero de' Medici returned back to wherever he came from. I think it was Rome, miserable and depressed and completely disillusioned about himself. And he was so sad that guess what happened? All of those instructions, those simple instructions that his father gave him, go to bed early, wake up early, eat light, all that went out the window. And the routine that his father tried to instill in him was gone. He would wake up late in the afternoon because he would stay up late. And he would wake up in the afternoon, he would walk downstairs, go to the kitchen, and he would see if anybody was cooking anything he liked. If they weren't cooking anything that he liked, he would leave the house, he would go to a restaurant, eat very rich foods, and then he would stay in this restaurant for hours and hours eating, and then he would leave the restaurant, hang out with his friends, walking through the streets all day, into the night, into the sunrise, then go back home and go to sleep. By the time he went to sleep, the sun was already up. And I must say, damn, that sounds like a lot of fun. Seriously, that sounds like a lot of fun. Waking up late, going to a restaurant, eating amazing food, hanging out with friends all day, just drinking, um, just shooting the, the you-know-what, ha just having great conversation. That sounds like a lot of fun. But he would also get a, a concubine, and he would have his way with her all day in a room, and he would do things like that as well. And he would wake up super late, and that's how and he would just live his life like that. His his brother, the cardinal Giovanni, still kept his father's instructions and woke up early, and would read and study and do his work as a cardinal, proving that Lorenzo de Medici was right about his sons. He saw Piero de Medici as irresponsible, and he saw Giovanni de Medici as someone who was uh, very uh, punctual. But I just find it so fascinating that here you had this powerful banking family. People were coming from parts of Europe to visit them. The Pope would go to them for money. There was this powerful banking family called the Medici. They were the wealthiest family in all of Europe at one point in time. 
and they spiral downwards to a point where their own city didn't even open the gates for them. Their own city didn't even open the gates for them. What a dismal ending. It's like something worthy of a film. Could you imagine a movie like this, where like the whole film, like the beginning of the movie is like the Medici's and they're wealthy and throwing these big parties and, and, and they're, they're throwing these big balls and they got like the little carnival masks on and like, like from the Count of Monte Cristo. And then there is like revolution and then there is war. And also there was a war between Florence and, and Pisa and, and Milan and Venice sided with Pisa against Florence and then the Vatican. The Vatican sent, uh, joined the alliance against Florence, and even the Vatican even tried to invade Florence, sent an army into Florence, and got its ass kicked, which is pretty crazy. The Vatican got its ass kicked fighting Florence. And then there's the Pope, and then there's like, it would just be an amazing movie. And then there's like that, there's like near the end of the film, it's like, we're gonna finally get back to Florence. And then there's silence. Kind of reminds me of when Xerxes fought the Spartans and lost, and Xerxes would spend the rest of his life in brothels. It's crazy how things end. It's so crazy how things end. Anyway, you guys just heard some Theo Lodgy. God bless. <laughs>